Assalamu alaikum. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, and I would like to really to thank you for joining us in Oracle Open World Middle East. Uh, myself and the management team of Oracle Corporation and the regional management team would like to thank you for the trust and confidence that you have built within Oracle uh, in, in the region. Based on that, we are happy to see such increase of our market presence and the trust by you and our partners in order for us to continue uh, our investment with you that I will share later on. Before I go into that, I would really like to thank His Excellency uh, Mr. Mohammed Ghaith, the Executive Director of Cybersecurity Operation at Abu Dhabi Digital Authority, who joined us yesterday as a keynote speaker who emphasized on, on the commitment from the UAE government to the market here and as an appreciation to Oracle presence in, in the region. Also, I would like to thank our customers across the Middle East uh, and Africa and India, who has been in Europe, who even actually go beyond uh, their time and join us into this uh, second edition of Oracle Middle East uh, Open World. This is the second time we run it in the region, and we're happy to see such uh, 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 presence and attendance from our customers who really take this as an opportunity to meet with Oracle executive and understand Oracle strategy in terms of roadmap, in terms of direction that would eventually help them capitalize on it and get the right presence of it. Uh, Oracle has been present in the Middle East uh, for almost three decades, and we're happy and honored to be here. And as a result of that, we have continued our investment. We have uh, started a number of activity within the region from a capacity building initiative point of view, an academic initiative point of view, we were able to work with many uh, higher education institutions to ensure the development of Oracle skill set that would increase the Oracle ecosystem that would eventually help our customer capitalize on the, uh, on, on the technology they use. Uh, second, we have uh, ex uh, announced recently an expansion of Oracle Cloud, uh, public cloud data center as you know, Oracle has stated the direction of, go, of opening up a public cloud data center, uh, one data center in every 23 days. And we're happy to state that we already have established the first uh, Oracle da public cloud data center in UAE. And in two weeks' time, we are going with the first uh, Oracle cloud infrastructure generation two in Saudi Arabia that will be launched soon. And that will be followed after that with three data centers, another one in UAE, another one in Saudi, and eventually in South Africa, covering, covering Africa. We are living in the world of data, and it's all about data. And today you will be uh, hearing more information about uh, data management itself. Oracle is, is, is the co-founder, again, of the database. And we believe that having such volume of data, if you don't have the data to manage itself, you will not be able to capitalize and get the right benefit out of it. Today you will hear from my colleagues who come across uh, the globe to share with you the experience and to share with you Oracle strategy towards uh, the latest uh, solution that we have for the data management. Before I leave the stage to them, I would like really to simply state our autonomous uh, strategy. As you know, we had a breakthrough in the industry with the autonomous database, with the autonomous database, but our clear strategy is really not to have the autonomous to eliminate the human capital, but rather autonomous to, el to eliminate the human error. With this, I would like to thank you, and I would like to wish you a great day, and I wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Please welcome Andrew Sutherland. Good morning. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, and a very warm welcome to day two of what is, of course, the first open world of 2020 here in Dubai. My name is Andrew Sutherland, and it's a great pleasure to be hosting you for this morning's session. Now, today, we're going to be taking a closer look at technology. I'm sure I can hear the pulse rates rising around about the room already. Yes, we're going to be speaking to members of the Oracle development team and learning from them what are the latest developments and innovations that they've been making behind these doors. We'll hear from them. But of course, we'll also hear the customers' voices and how that technology is being put to good use to drive competitive advantage and, of course, business 
benefit. Now, it's no exaggeration, is it, to say that the whole population of the globe is increasingly looking towards technology to drive progress. We live longer lives, lives better health, in large part because of technology. But the more that we, all of us, in technology try and meet that demand, guess what? The more that demand rises. And today, we have unprecedented demand from the world around us for technological solutions. We need to be able to build goods, farm food, and distribute it, but with as little damage to the environment and great efficiency as possible. Sounds like a job where information, data, and technology can help. We need to look after the health, of course, of ourselves and our families, but also of our employees. Help them live better and longer lives. Sounds again like a place where technology can help in the longevity of the citizen. And of course, let's not forget commerce. We need to be able to conduct more and more transactions in a bigger and bigger world, often dealing in large amounts with people whom we'll never meet. And yet, we need to hold them in trust. Again, job for technology. Now, the way that we'll meet these challenges is going to be different for each one of us. When we get back to our desks in the morning after this session and day, we'll start developing and using and deploying and buying new applications, new business processes, and each one of them will be helping us towards these new goals and greater success and greater efficiency. We'll do it in different ways. But there's something in common. There's something we can be sure of which is essential to success. And our forebears knew this when they were building their systems. We need to equip ourselves with the best possible tools. We can't build the structures for digital systems and digital businesses using obsolete tools from yesterday. We can't build successful wealth creation in a digital world if we're using second-rate tools. Now, these tools or enabling technologies may come in very many different forms. They may be something as sophisticated and complete as what we would call a business application, ERP, CRM, HCM. They can look after a large proportion of an enterprise's operations. They may be something more specialized, a data management system looking after the lifeblood of the organization, or even the underlying infrastructure upon which we build all of our digital business. But we need to be aware of and use and embrace and understand the very best tools to build the very best business. That is why we're here. Now, we're going to hear from the designers and creators of these tool sets, which we can all use. We've got a chance to ask these folks questions. This is the beauty of an open world, is we bring these developers to you. We drag them away from their desks in San Francisco, make sure they're here at our disposal. So we're going to listen to them. And of course, we're also going to hear the voices of our customers, some on video and some on stage, about how these technologies are effectively used. But before we begin that exploration, perhaps I can spend literally just five minutes setting the context for what we are about to explore. It's a journey, of course, at the center of which is the customer or citizen or patient, but they're surrounded by technology providing services to them to lead their lives. Now, whenever technology is involved in any sort of story, you're almost inevitably going to hear the dreaded TLA, the three-letter acronym. And those of us in technology here, we know our lives are full of three-letter, sometimes four-letter acronyms. Now, we've done our best to remove as many TLAs as possible, but some are going to creep up. One of them you might hear of pretty early is a TLA 
O-C-I. Now, you can probably guess what the O stands for, given where we are. Yes, it's Oracle. And the CI is Cloud Infrastructure. Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. Simple acronym, simple phrase. But actually, behind that, every time we hear it, is one of the most profound investments made by an enterprise technology company in the last decade. Oracle effectively went back to the drawing board and reinvented cloud specifically for the enterprise, created a second generation cloud wholly for the needs of the enterprise. Now, the enterprise got some very specific needs and extraordinary needs when it comes to security. Like all of us, the enterprise needs to look after its information. But critically, almost all modern digital enterprises need to look after other people's information also. And that, of course, is an enormous responsibility. Now, for that reason, OCI, the Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, the underlying compute, storage, and so many other services on which we run our digital business, for that reason, OCI's first three design criteria were security, security, and security. We're going to hear more about how that's been implemented. Now, of course, there are many other design criteria for the enterprise, performance, cost-effectiveness, scalability, and so on. But there's one other one that's often overlooked. We thought about hard when it came to creating a second-generation cloud. Anybody who's been alive for any length of time knows that however golden the apple is, however attractive this secure, performant, cost-effective cloud might be, or whatever the product is, it's pretty useless if it can't be reached, if it's not accessible. It's one thing having the world's most incredible technology, but if I can't get to it, what's the point? And so right from the outset of this drawing board, the OCI team thought, let's make sure we make this almost trivially simple, not just of course, to create new applications using Python and Parl and Kubernetes, of course, of course. But let's make it as simple as we possibly can to take a much-loved and much-used existing business application and lift it and shift it onto the cloud. Fast, simple, risk-free. Let's design that in from the start. Better still, not just lift and shift, move it and improve it as we move. Take advantage of the new services. That's built in to OCI. And we'll hear more about that in just a minute. Now, if the infrastructure is the body of the digital business, then, of course, it's not going to be much use unless there's data circulating around that body to keep it alive. We need to have data being absorbed, data being managed, data being integrated, data being visualized, and at the heart there's going to be a heart of any circulation system. At the heart of a data circulation system in the digital business is, of course, a database, a subject about which Oracle knows a thing or two. Now, we're very privileged this morning to have a member of the Oracle development team here, actually hails originally from this region, who's been a member of the Oracle development team for 30 years. I'm going to take advantage of him being here. And he's going to describe to us not only the autonomous database, the world's first, I'm sure not last, there'll be plenty of copies, I'm sure, but the world's first autonomous database looks after itself. Not only will we be discussing that, but also the issue of dealing of the ever burgeoning, prolific new formats in which we manage our data in an internet world. We're all very familiar with the rows and columns of tabular information. But when we have IoT in the web, we've got IoT, spatial graph, and so on. We've got send window open, window open, door closed, key value pairs. It's all digital. We can store it in a relational database if you want to, but it's not the most efficient way to do it. This leads to temptation to build multiple data circulation systems, multiple data management systems 
in one digital business. It's not a good idea. It can't be a good idea. How can you keep multiple data management systems secure? How are you going to manage them all cost effectively? How are you going to keep them synchronized? We're going to hear our answer to that to make sure that we can keep our most vital asset in one place. There's a third vital organ in the body of the digital business, the body itself, the heart and the data system. Of course, there's that organ between the ears. We'll form ourselves in the future, as we do today, into organizations, into teams. We'll call them governments. We'll call them corporations, companies, enterprises. We'll form ourselves into teams. But these teams and groups, they'll need to make decisions. They'll need to know, do we invest here? Do we invest there? What do we do in this situation? Will we, in, will we do this? Will we do that? Where's the brain going to come from in the digital business? It's going to come from the same place that it always has and it always will. It'll be us. Human beings, we'll run these digital businesses. Of course we will. But we'll need help. In the same way that our forebears needed help as they tried to plow larger and larger fields and fish bigger and bigger oceans, we'll need help as we make decisions in a digital world. We can't meet every customer ourselves. We can't hear what every customer... We can't remember every single patient we ever treated and what the outcome was from that. We can't think every customer we ever made an offer to, how was that offer received? We can't do that. But machines can. They can watch, listen, and learn from what we do and the decisions we make. Then they can use that learning to advise us, to suggest who might be the next best person to employ in that role, which might be the best vendor from whom we should buy that product. Intelligent business applications built upon OCI and Autonomous Database are revolutionizing the whole concept of managing organizations by providing intelligent suggestions every decision point within the organization. Now, we are going to go through all of these, the OCI, the Autonomous Database, and of course, these intelligent business applications. So let's begin by going back to um, the OCI piece, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. We're building out, as you heard from Abdul Rahman, we're building out our infrastructure across the globe. In fact, we're building data centers at the rate of one every three weeks a regional data center is built to facilitate the use of OCI by digital businesses around about the world. Every three weeks, a new regional data center with ones imminently appearing in this region and in Saudi and in South Africa, and so on the expansion goes. We're going to hear in just a minute from somebody from development who's responsible for the part of the team designing OCI and also been working with us on that regional expansion. But before we do, let's hear the voice of some customers who've been using OCI at the foundation of their digital business. Can we roll the first video, please? Our move to the cloud was primarily driven from the perspective of our need for flexibility, scalability. We've seen a performance improvement of 20 to 25%. The users have expressed how much they've appreciated now the improved performance of the platform. Using the Kubernetes installation enabled us to drop that processing from one week to eight hours, which has been fundamentally important. Exadata is really the only solution that is able to provide them with the speed and the high ability that they need to manage those critical operations 24 by 7 in an environment that really can't afford any downtime. We really felt that for the e-business suite stack that OCI was the perfect story for us of better, cheaper, faster. The machines are performing way better than the hardware that we were running on premise before. Our interactive response time, on average, is 0.07 seconds. They say we are their fastest performing J.D. Edwards client. Better, cheaper, faster. How can that be true? How can it be better on every axis? Surely you have to give one 
to uh, take away from the other. But you know, my dad's car used to do about, I think, maximum 70 miles an hour and 20 miles for every gallon. Mine can do 140 miles an hour and does about 60 miles for every gallon minimum. How, how can it be both? The answer simply is, of course, better engineering. That's how we've done it. Now, when we talk of Oracle engineering and Oracle development, we always think, I'm sure many of you think of San Francisco, the Golden Gate Bridge, the beauty of the bay, people sailing, and the attractions of the sunshine and surfing, which, of course, is very much true in San Francisco. And when we set up the OCI development team to reinvent the cloud, we thought we want these folks to work hard, not surf and sail in the bay. So we set up the team not in San Francisco, we set it up in Seattle, where it rains, so they have to go inside and work hard. Makes me think the next development center for Oracle ought to be in Northern Scotland. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome, fresh from Seattle, rainy Seattle, Andy Fenslow. Andy. There's your clicker, man. What? I'm OCI Andy, and apparently, I'm here to talk about the body. So, first, a, a question for all of you. How many of you, with the raise of your hand, have already moved your core enterprise applications to the cloud, to a cloud? Doesn't have to be our cloud. How many? How many of you, over the next few years, would like to? Oh, come on, really? All right. I bet it's a lot more. Most of us are facing this profound call to action from our customers, from our board, from our governments to drive that cloud migration. But just like the very few hands that went up for my first question, it's hard. There's a reason why so few of you feel confident and ready to move to the cloud. It's because the first generation of public clouds Amazon, Microsoft, Google. They just weren't built for those workloads. They were built for what I call bottoms-up workloads, things like DevOps, analytics, data science, not core mission-critical workloads. That's a really different design objective. So the analysts, IDC, Gartner, they all, they all say, you know, only about 20 to 30% of the workloads have moved to the cloud, and that's why. So for Oracle, we had to really think about what do we need to do differently to move these core enterprise applications, the mission-critical databases, all the things around that confidently without compromising your on-premises service level agreements. Um, so hey, we've all heard about the first mover advantage well, in our case, there is a late mover advantage. Because we've come in later to this cloud party, we've been able to take advantage of some fundamentally different technologies that were available four years ago as we designed our Gen 2 enterprise cloud that were not available for the Gen 1 cloud providers. Things like some of the core networking, flat network and network virtualization, things like flash storage and the fabrics around it, and things, some of the breakthroughs in security and the zero trust approach to active security. So we've been able to build a fundamentally different cloud. I'll talk about a few of the key examples there. Um, we be believe that you should be able to move with confidence to the cloud without fundamental compromises. You have service level agreements today on-prem. Why should you change those as you move to the cloud in the future? So what's it good for? Let's, let's, talk, let's dig in. First, we have seen over our first few thousand customers, few thousand customers, a broad mix of workloads. One, of course, is our Oracle applications. Um, eBusiness Suite, JD Edwards, PeopleSoft. Two, many of the custom applications and workloads around that, using some of our traditional tools like WebLogic and Java, uh, but also cloud-native workloads. Also, performance-intensive workloads. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But high-performance computing, things like oil and gas, 
We offer profound differences versus what you can get with our GPU and RDMA technologies versus other clouds. But we've also got one major opportunity that none of the other cloud vendors have, which is our Fusion applications. So for all of you that have already moved to some of our software as a service options, like Wendy will be talking about, all of that is running on this second generation OCI. That gives us profound scale, global reach, and it's a lot of why we are able to expand our region coverage as quickly as we are, because we have that as the wind in our sails. Now, there are a few key technology enablers I want to offer up as examples of why we can do things that none of the first generation public clouds can do. Let's start with networking. Um, we have something that we call off-box or off-host network virtualization. That means a couple things. One, it means that uh, you have security. As Andrew said, our first design objective and our second and our third was security. So no one, including us, gets on to the hosts that you are using for your workloads. All the management, all the control that we need as the cloud service provider is done off host. We don't have hypervisors and all the things that the first generation cloud vendors do. It also gives us extraordinary performance, consistent, predictable networking performance that the others just can't match. And we don't have mixed uh, over subscription on that network. So you will always get consistent, extraordinary networking performance. Another example is um, on the, the way that we are enabling your traditional data management solutions. These are, as Andrew said in his analogy, this is the heart. So when you move to the cloud, you probably don't want a heart transplant. You've got enough other things going on with your body. So we're the only public cloud that has an infrastructure that can natively support things like Oracle Rack, Exadata, and of course, the truly unique Oracle Autonomous Database. Those can only run on Oracle Cloud. And lastly, I want to double click on security again, because that is where we started and where we finished with Oracle Cloud for your mission-critical enterprise workloads. Um, we have a fundamentally different philosophy. So I'm not going to talk about technology. I'm going to talk about philosophy. When you look at the other cloud vendors, if you read the details of their security legalese in the contracts, if there is a security breach, if there is exposed data for your customers, it is your responsibility. And as Larry Ellison said in the Open World San Francisco keynote, for us, it's different. It is our responsibility. That is part of our approach, as it has always been, because we have had your most valuable and sensitive data for over 30 years. So that's the way it has to be for us. So it's a really different approach. Now, with that, we've applied some really different technologies around security. Uh, the basic approach is zero trust, and the basic model that we announced at uh, Open World in San Francisco is active security, what we call uh, maximum security zones. So the idea here is it's always on. It's default. Of course, you can reduce your security policies, but it is default always on. It is holistic. It covers everything. And then you're in control. But this is, this is a, a step towards the autonomous model that we all talk about. OK, and one last thing, by the way. If you're hearing all this and you think, oh, boy, yeah, it's great, great performance, great technology, but man, Oracle's going to charge us a lot. We're not. We've learned a few things. Another advantage of being a late mover is we've seen how the market has reacted to some of the pricing policies that the first generation clouds have, things like data egress which are fundamentally lock-in policies. If they charge you to take your data out of their cloud, and if they charge you a lot, hmm, that feels like a lock-in to me. So we have really different pricing models, and indeed, many, many of our customers have gotten consistently 30 to 50% lower total cost of ownership than they had on-prem 
and 30 to 50% lower total cost of ownership than on other clouds. So it's a very strong cost opportunity. So many of you, many of you in this audience have already begun this journey with us, and I want to thank you. And I want to thank you for the dozens of you who have spoken or are speaking in some of the sessions. Some of you are sharing your best practices from your journey, and I want to thank you. Most of all, I want to thank you for trusting us. This is your most important workloads and your most important data. We will not let you down. Now, there's another reality here, which is when you're talking about moving to the cloud, you need to look at the same vendor lock-in issues as you looked at on on-prem. On on-prem, over the years, we learned you put the right tool for the right workload. That is just as true for cloud. That is just as true for cloud. So we have had a very aggressive approach to building out our partnerships for the multi-cloud and hybrid cloud reality that you require. So we've done something truly unique with Microsoft for interoperability, support, and an incredibly low latency, one millisecond latency interconnect with the Azure data centers so that you can have workloads, workflows that cross both clouds back and forth. You can have it your way. And a joint collaborative standardized support model so you don't get that big company finger pointing. Likewise, for VMware, we have driven the first true VMware native opportunity. Again, it comes back to our core technologies. That network and that networking virtualization is the only thing that allows VMware to run natively on OCI. On every other first generation cloud, it's VMware as a service. So if you want full control, you want full control over VMware security and VMware uh, patching and updates, you can't do it. So we're really proud that for those of you in the audience who may have VMware workloads that you'd like to move to the cloud and manage together, we have the first solution. And then lastly, we have dozens of other partners across your enterprise stacks, high performance computing stacks in our enterprise marketplace. This is one of the best ways that you can either bring your own license or you can pay as you go using your Oracle Universal Credits all out of the console. For many of them, it's a single click automated deployment and integration with your Oracle apps. One last thing, there's a lot to consider for planning your migrations. This was the, the third thing that Andrew talked about for OCI, that migration, that lift and shift, that move and improve. We have thousands of customers who have already done it. So we have a lot of the best practices. And of course, we want to share them with you. Our partners, our system integrator and managed service provider partners want to share them with you. So um, a lot of that migration advantage comes down to a simple thing we have a wonderfully unfair advantage. We have an unfair advantage because only Oracle of all the cloud vendors, only Oracle controls the infrastructure, what I've been talking about, the databases, what Chetan's going to talk about, and the applications, what Emily's going to talk about. Because we have control of all three, we can make application migration, database migration incredibly simple with things like Cloud Manager for PeopleSoft, and JD Edwards, and, uh, and eBusiness e Suite, and things like the Zero Downtime Migration Service for, the for any of the databases. So that migration part of your journey and of your challenge is super simple, super safe with Oracle Cloud. With that, I will thank you and take my leave. Thank you very much indeed, Andy. Just before you go, I know you guys are not only spending your time designing technically, but you're also co coordinating computing arriving, networks going in as we actually build out these data centers. I, wonder, I mentioned earlier on, I wonder if you could show us a little bit more of the global expansion of OCI, making it truly ah, available. OK, I can do that, actually. On that clicker back. So I do have a picture. Just, oh, we lost the slides. 
Well, I can't show it to you if I lost the slides. <laughs> oh, okay. Could you talk but, us through briefly then? Yes. Andy, if it's so, um, and actually, if you guys could switch back to the slide, that'd be great. So, as, as you've already heard, we are rolling out this regional coverage really aggressively. One, because the opportunity is there and our differentiation is now. It's a good business strategy. Two, because another part of our innovation, another part of what makes us so different from the Gen 1 cloud vendors, is we have automated the entire process for rolling out new regional data centers. So for us, it is a very, very simple, fast, low-risk model to build out those new data centers. Um, in fact, for many of them, the biggest bottleneck is government regulatory approvals mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. things like that. So, uh, and again, we have a lot of the wind in our sails from the Oracle Fusion apps running on our data centers. So that's a, a core part of the reason why we're able to move quickly. The last thing I'll say is your, your workloads, your enterprise workloads are everywhere in every different country. And many governments have requirements that you have to keep the data in those countries. So that's why we are rolling out so fast, is to meet your needs, your demand, meet the government requirements, and we're building out two in each of these regions. Fantastic, and it's much appreciated. Andy, we're going to leave it there. Thank, thank you very much indeed again thank for thank joining you. us. We'll see you later. Thank All you very right. much, Andy. And ladies and gentlemen, do, do please take advantage again. The difference of an open world session compared with others is that guys like Andy are here. And as you saw from the session descriptions there, many of the developers are over in this region. So take the chance, nail them, and ask, ask your questions. Now let's move on from the body to the, the circulation, the data circulation system, and at its heart, the database. My next expert, coming up in just a minute, will be somebody who spent 30 years in Oracle development developing that very database. But before we meet him, let's hear the voices of a few customers who are making use of the autonomous database. Let me roll the next video, please. Manufacturing faces a new industrial revolution. Manufacturers are under constant pressure to innovate, to be ever more efficient, but with fewer resources. And the world's most prestigious manufacturers are turning to us to help them. At Meztech, we use cloud technology to optimize the whole of the manufacturing life cycle, from process definition, through planning and execution. Our tools help companies improve all aspects of manufacturing performance, saving them time and money. But we can't do it alone. Oracle's Autonomous Transaction Processing Database is the foundation of our solution to manage the whole of the manufacturing lifecycle. Using ATP in combination with the Microsoft Azure Interconnect is saving us half the infrastructure and labour costs compared to an equivalent on-premise environment. And we're now seeing some workloads run 600% faster on Autonomous than they did on our legacy environment, with half the CPUs. Many of our customers operate 24-7 and ATP provides zero downtime. ATP patches, maintains and tunes itself, providing a more secure environment, allowing us to focus our resources on developing innovative solutions for our customers. I think manufacturing customers should be embracing autonomous technology now because the future is happening now, with Meztech and Oracle is making anything possible. Amazing. I've been in Oracle for 25 years and it never ceases to amaze me how there's still so many improvements can be made to what's already a very mature and capable technology. One of the individuals who's very much responsible for driving that change is Chetan Osvatan, who's going to join me now. Chetan's been in Oracle even longer than I have, 30 years. He started his life in this region in Turkey, was attracted by the sunshine of San Francisco Bay. Chetan, please, it's all yours. Ladies and gentlemen, Chetan Osvatan. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here with you all representing the Oracle Database Development Team talking about our innovations. We continue to innovate in our usual areas like performance, scalability, security, high availability, transactions and analytics. But over the uh, last couple of years, most of our innovation focused on two areas and that's what I want to highlight over the next few minutes. The first of the two areas is the idea of a converged database. A converged database stands in contrast with highly specialized databases that claim to be good at one thing. For example, key value stores, JSON stores, graph databases, 
analytics databases, etc. Most of you will remember that there were these specialized devices that were very common in our lives a few years back. Phones that only made phone calls, cameras to take pictures, messaging devices, music devices to listen to music. Today, they're just features of a converged product called the smartphone. Similarly, key value, JSON, in-memory, graph, sharding, etc., are becoming features of a converged database. Oracle is the only company in the world that is a leader both in enterprise applications and databases. That unique position enables Oracle to create cutting-edge database technologies that power the next generation applications. So what are these key innovations that make Oracle the best converged database? At the core of it all is the Oracle multi-tenant architecture, where we give you pluggable databases. Thousands of pluggable databases, or PDBs, that can live in a container database or a CDB. PDBs are ideal for microservices. You can build your microservices using pluggable databases. Each microservice can be a separate PDB, but many of them can be managed as one, thereby providing you huge cost efficiencies. With Oracle multi-tenant, developers can also write modern enterprise class SaaS applications, managing thousands of tenants without having to program multi-tenancy in their app. A second key innovation of our converged database is its native support for JSON and XML. When you put your JSON objects in, uh, in the converged database, you not only get a great document database, but you have the full power of the converged database with its parallel SQL, asset consistency, security, high availability, et cetera, all of it. Another key innovation in this area is machine learning. We have dozens of machine learning algorithms inside our converged database. Developers can take advantage of those in their applications. For example, real-time scoring can be built directly in your operational database or as a standalone microservice using Oracle Machine Learning. Upcoming AutoML will enable even non-experts to take advantage of predictive analytics. And here's some great news. On-premises, Oracle Machine Learning was part of a paid option of the Oracle database. But we want all developers taking advantage of this capability. So we have now started including Oracle Machine Learning for free on-premises with all of the Oracle databases. These are just a few of uh, the innovations that make it possible for us to offer a converged database. With a converged database, you do not need many databases just to run one application. You can mix workloads, data types, transactions and analytics in a secure, highly available manner. With a converged database, you prevent data fragmentation and copy contagion. You eliminate the initial and recurring database integration costs. So that was the first area of innovation, the converged database. Let's move on to the second area of innovation, and that's the autonomous database. If you're an existing Oracle database customer, what benefit would you get by taking advantage of this innovation? Let's take a look. Autonomous database is truly a revolution in data management for our customers. It transforms the work of our customers from building and maintaining databases to using an autonomous service on modern cloud. It's a very different experience from the on-prem experience of running the Oracle database. Today, autonomous database identifies over 85%, specifically 88% of issues without needing a service request to be filed by a customer. If you're an existing Oracle database customer and are spending time with service requests, just imagine you know, getting 88% of your time back. 
In addition, median fixed time for an autonomous database service request is four times faster than on-prem. It says six times on the slides. The reality is four times. I, I correct it. Why is everything so much uh, better uh, with the autonomous database? The key is automation. We automated everything. We automated monitoring, issue prediction and detection, bug filing, diagnostics collection, patching, and continuous integration. All this automation allows my cloud ops team to run 50 times more databases today than 18 months ago with no increase in team size. Just imagine that for the databases that you're running. The same team size gets to run 50 times more databases, and that's only possible through automation. We have thousands of autonomous database customers today, and they're providing great testimonials. We have customers who say they increase their performance by 12x, 40x, 40 times faster than what they used to run on-premises. We have customers testifying that they reduce their labor costs by 2x, while at the same time increasing the output by 2x. We have customers who are able to quantify the additional value that they are getting from their existing data. Millions of dollars worth. You can find out more details about these customers and other customers on oracle.com. Thank you for your attention. Very much indeed, Chetan, ladies and gentlemen, Chetan. Okay, so we're the final part of our journey here. Let's move on to the brain. And before we do, as always, let's hear some voices of the customers who are using Oracle's intelligent business applications. Can we roll the last video, please? <music> In 1935, our founder Francesco Illi realized that working with pressure was the key to making great espresso coffee. He understood that by reducing heat and increasing pressure, he could produce a rounder, richer and more flavorful coffee. This invention and moment of pure intuizione is at the origin of the modern espresso coffee machine. Over 80 years later, Data help us work with the pressures of serving 8 million coffees a day, climate change affecting our growers' land, and increasing competition on every corner. What's exciting is that with the right intelligence and energy to act, we can stay true to our ethics and responsibilities while offering the greatest coffee to the world. With Oracle, we can do magical things, no matter what the pressures are. Now you might think if I'm introducing somebody from an applications development business, they're going to be people who maybe write forms, look at uh, process workflows and perhaps reports and so on, but no. Our next expert is actually somebody who's really expert in human computer interfaces, artificial intelligence, and of course, robotics. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome from the intelligent applications development team, Emily Ge. Emily, it's all yours. Okay. Good morning, everyone. It's such a privilege to be presenting in Dubai. UAE is, is one of the few countries, tech forward countries, where the government, business, and citizens are aligned in leveraging emerging technology to pull ahead of other countries, support economic growth, and create a brighter future for the country. So um, I'm super excited to be here. And what I want to talk about today is a little bit around how we're leveraging the technology stack and the importance of the technology stack for cloud applications. Now, at Oracle, what we believe is cloud ap applications are all about enabling the right collaboration between humans and machines. Now, machines has uh, now become an integral part of human life ever since the Industrial Revolution. We see machines everywhere in our lives, whether it's agriculture, performing medical procedures, or uh, all modes of transportation, delivering goods and services to your homes, or manufacturing electronics. But one thing that didn't change for a long time is the relationship between humans and machines. It's very much a relationship between a master and a slave. So you tell the machine exactly what to do, and the machines will perform these processes or steps until you tell them to stop. Um, so 
the relationship between humans and machines literally hasn't changed for hundreds of years. Now, in the last few years, that has started to change. And this is because of the advancement in voice devices, in um, natural language processing, in machine learning, in artificial intelligence, in conversational user interface. For the first time, we're able to engage with machines like human beings. So you can use your voice to talk to machines, and they are starting to think like machines. Uh, they're starting to think like humans, and they're starting to learn like humans. So a few examples of how this is unfolding in our day-to-day -day lives. In the US, for example, it's projected that there will be more than 870 million voice devices by year uh, 2022. That's only two years from now. So that is three voice devices per person. That's a lot. And in many households, children are now growing up with Alexa. And um, for these children who grew up that way, their first three words are now mama, dada, and Alexa. They literally think Alexa is a little person living in the box, and she's a member of the household. One of the, my favorite things about my mobile phone is um, it tells me every morning when I should go to work because it's synthesizing my calendar data and the real-time traffic data. I'm a huge fan of the Fitbit. I'm wearing it right now. And I feel like my Fitbit really cares about me because it knows exactly how many steps I'm walking and it's giving me these inspirational messages like, you're on track, good job, and um, it's giving me recommendations on what exercises I should be doing and how much I should be sleeping. So across all these different examples, there are three things I want all of you to notice. The first one is, for the first time, we can talk to machines like you're talking to another human using our natural language, whether it's your voice or your text. The second thing is, machines are starting to think like human beings, and they are acting like a, an assistant or a friend, and they are giving you recommendations on what actions you should be taking. So essentially, the relationship between humans and machines is now evolving to that of a digital assistant instead of a digital slave. The third thing is, this has profound implication on the way we design software. In the past, you have to prescribe the business processes to software and ask the software to perform the kind of processes you wanted to perform. Now, you can put input data into the system and the machines can learn by itself if you specify the kind of output you're looking for. This is a brand new way of engaging with software and designing software. So the interesting thing is, this is already having a profound impact on the relationship between technology and people, as well as human and, humans and humans. And it's starting to change the expectation from your employees and your customers in terms of the product and services you're providing. This year, we did an interesting survey around AI at work. So it's a global study. We went to survey 8,370 employees, managers, and HR professionals. And the findings are fascinating. So the first thing is 50% um, of the people globally and 62% of the people in UAE are saying they are already using some form of AI in the workplace. And we did a similar survey last year. The percentage was 32%. So within one year, there's a huge jump. The other thing is, last year when we did this survey, people expressed more concerns and fear about AI replacing their jobs. This year, we're seeing a lot more excitement. 65% of the people globally and 72% of the people in UAE are saying they feel optimistic they feel excited, and they feel grateful to have AI coworkers. Probably the more shocking finding is this is also changing the relationship between people and people. So 64% of the people globally and 74% of the people in UAE said they would trust a robot more than their manager, and half of the people have already turned to robot for advice. 82% of the people globally said um, they think robots can do things better than their managers. 
Now, this may sound very gloom for the managers, and it, to be honest, it's a bit unfair for the managers, because if you really look into the data, what people are really saying is not that they don't want human managers anymore, but rather that there are things that robots are good at, and there are things that humans are uniquely good at. So for example, in the UAE, people are saying robots are uniquely good at maintaining a work schedule, solving specific problems, providing unbiased information to employees. And what they would rather have their managers focus on are human things. For example, showing empathy, understanding their employees' feelings, providing personalized coaching, as well as evaluating teams' performance and cultivating a stronger sense of culture. So the reason I want to talk about all this is one of the things we do at Oracle is we want to invest in emerging technology on your behalf, and we want to look ahead into the market to see what trends are shaping the expectations of your customers and your employees so we can proactively invest in technology innovation to help you prepare for the future. So how exactly are we doing that? The first thing is we have a complete suite of applications ranging from CRM, sales service marketing, to ERP, financials, supply chain manufacturing and project procurement, also HR, benefits, talent management, recruiting, the entire suite of applications. And all this is possible by leveraging our underlying technology, different data type, the common data model that has different data types, blockchain in the database, with a single set of development tools that makes it possible for us to create this fully integrated suite of applications. The other thing we focus on is data. In Oracle Cloud applications, um, not only can we process your transaction data and operational data from your business applications, but we also enrich that data with third-party data. So in 2018, we bought a company called Datafox, and um, what Datafox provides is the ability to accommodate third-party data, including business data about the partners you're doing business with, or consumer data, whether it's behavioral data or demographic data, or uh, product usage data and engagement data. Datafox um, scours 50,000 different data, digital pieces of information every 30 minutes and five, six million websites every month. And all of this is we're using to tune our machine learning algorithm into actions and recommendations. When we moved our applications to the cloud, we also accelerated the pace of innovation. So every quarter, we're releasing new functionality, we're releasing feature enhancements, and that's fantastic. Uh, for example, lately, we released things like process manufacturing and a student finance system, as well as joint venture accounting, all of which are very exciting. But if you are on cloud applications, you will also get the invisible updates av available in our technology stack. Whenever we make enhancements on our autonomous database, our applications will run more reliably, run faster, and become more secure. And all of that enhancement you get for free simply because your applications are sitting on top of the technology stack. Now, how does this all come together? We talked about SaaS applications, we talk about our technology stack, we talk about data. So how do you experience the power of a technology? One of the biggest push we're making to the point I was talking about at the beginning of this presentation is now customers want a different user experience. Your customers and your employees expect to engage with the system in a different way. So our big push is to transition our application from a input-driven system to a output-driven system. Based on the data, the system will give you insights, give you recommendations on the best actions you take, and we literally have infused machine learning and AI in all our applications. In sales, for example, we have predictive account scoring. In marketing, we have predictive campaign planning. We have anomaly detection in supply chain. In finance, we have intelligent cash management, um, and in HR, we have the next best candidate uh, that will allow you to fill your vacancies much faster 
with predictive attrition as well as performance. So that's our move forward strategy. And because of the size of our customer base, our algorithm gets better over time. We have already um, released a lot of uh, recommendations. In field services, we have surfaced more than 600 million recommendations, more than 50 million recommendations in the commerce cloud. And in sales, we have provided more than 4 million recommendations. And as our customers use these recommendations, the machine learning algorithm will get fine-tuned. And over time, the recommendations will get better and better. And that's how you get more value out of our cloud applications. Another very exciting flavor of AI and machine learning is digital assistant. We believe our vision for enterprise software is in the future, we want to connect data directly to the user experience. And we envision a future where employees can get their work done without having to touch the software. So we have now applied a universal digital assistant across all our apps. And this digital assistant has multiple skills. Not only can you use the digital assistant to perform HR transactions, for example, access HR directory or your paycheck, getting your vacation approved. You can use the same digital assistant to get your expense reports processed, as well as update your sales forecast. This digital assistant, um, you can access it from any communication platform. You can access this from your browser, from your mobile phone, using voice or text. You can also access the digital assistant through any social collaboration platform, for example, Slack. So what I just quickly walked through is how we're blending the complete suite of applications, our best-in-class technology stack, data, all infused with machine learning and AI throughout the application, and with universal digital assistant increasingly as the primary user interface. We're extremely confident that we are the right technology partner for you to work with as you move towards the future. And we very much look forward to working with all of you to achieve success in the cloud. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, we've heard from a number of the experts within Oracle. Now, my last guest and expert is not an expert from Oracle at designing and developing our platform and tools, but instead is an expert in using them. So let's hear from somebody who's actually taken some of these tools and is using them in anger in the red hot business of financial technology services. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Eric Briva. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks Eric, Andrew. do take a seat. Come on, sit down. So Eric, you've been using many of the technologies we've just been uh, hearing about. And you're using them in an area of uh, technology, which is really red hot and financial technology services in strands, your company. I wonder if you could begin by telling us all just briefly, what is your organization? What does it do? OK. Uh, trillions of transactions happens every day in banking. Uh, all those trillions of transactions has a really hidden patterns and relationship uh, that banks don't even know how to realize that value they have in their data. Uh, so Strands provides banks and financial institutions with an artificial intelligence platform to um, enhance that data and generate I actionable insights on their data. Fantastic. Being actionable, uh, that the most relevant insights, we also provide a recommendation for next best action realize for the bank and for the customers. Fantastic. So, so again, you're not making the decision, but you're advising and suggesting the humans who are running the business on patterns that they may themselves just not have been able to see because of the sheer volume. Exactly, of the exactly. So, and that value has been uh, put in place for more than 700 banks worldwide. Wow. So. Fantastic. Now, you, like many here, Eric, and we're very grateful for that, are users of Oracle, were users of Oracle technology on premise. But you chose to move onto the cloud. Why? Well, that's, uh, that's obvious. Um, we have been serving uh, hundreds of banks on-premise uh, with our technology based on Oracle on-premise. 
uh, but also moving forward to, to the cloud when we realize uh, that, the, I mean, we have been working for larger financial institutions yep. in order to target uh, smaller banks and a wider range of customers, uh, we decided to move to the cloud. Um, so we had evaluated four different cloud providers, including uh, Azure, Google Cloud, mm -hmm. and um, uh, Oracle Cloud. Yep. So um, by far, we have finally decided that Oracle Cloud will be the best choice uh, for many reasons, not only for the, the way it is conceived, the, the total infrastructure on the cloud, but also the value provided by the autonomous technologies in, in there. Okay. So, to, so it's the combination, as we've been describing, the, the, the OCI, but that facilitates autonomous and, of course, the applications on, on top of that. Uh, I wonder if you can describe for me, obviously in your business, security is particularly important. We've been speaking about that a lot. Can you tell us, from the eyes of a user, just how does Oracle technology help you manage what is very sensitive information? Yeah, actually, uh, of course, we as an organization complies with a lot of uh, security uh, standards like the different ISOs, uh, data protections, and, and business continuity and so on. But um, the way the Oracle platform is, is structured where it can uh, protect the data even for for the customer, yeah. even for for the bank, even for the uh, for the provider of the technology, uh, actually made us uh, sleep very well at night every every day. And we and I can say that after having more than 700 implementation with Oracle. Yeah, so we have never had it. Helping you sleep at night is very important. Yeah. So this is the isolation of data, which comes yeah. as a, as courtesy of the underlying infrastructure. Last question, Eric. The journey. Um, I spoke earlier on, one of the design principles was to try and make it easy to move to the cloud. Could you talk about how you went through that process, what you had to do to actually get there? Yeah, the first we did was to move all of our information technology to the cloud. So we, we did, I mean, we were testing it for ourselves first. So we implemented it in four different clouds. Finally, we chose an Oracle, which was the one that performed better mm -hmm. than the others. And then we had uh, implemented the first uh, bank, mm -hmm. which is a self-bank in Madrid. Okay. Actually, one of the best main advantages that we have seen by using Oracle Cloud and Autonomous Database is the fastest implementation times. So we have done this project for this bank uh, in two and a half months, right. which has been by far uh, faster than any other implementation we had them Isn't it done so before. It's one thing having fantastic technology, but again, it needs to be accessible and usable. Eric, thank you so much for joining us on the stage to describe your experiences. Pleasure, and Andrew. Eric Avriva, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And so, ladies and gentlemen, our journey is complete. I spent a few days at the change of the year between December and January indulging in my favorite hobby, which is home automation. Not just a couple of Amazon Alexas. I've got every light bulb in the house has got a Zigbee address. Every window and door is connected. And I was spending my holiday days enjoyably programming all of that until I discovered I was spending about 70% of my time looking after the old Linux PC, which I was trying to run this on. So, of course, I thought, what an idiot. Why don't I use the Oracle Cloud? And I went and took out what's called a free tier, that's free, F-R-E-E. -E. I know it's difficult for a Scots person to say, but it's a free cloud, and you can log on and have for life access to Oracle's, the infrastructure you've been hearing about, and credit access to a wider range of tools. And in no time at all, I was up and running with OCI and was able to concentrate on annoying my wife by turning on and off lights at random in the house. Took away the drudgery of managing Linux, but it reminded me, in closing, of one of the most important views that's been seen in, in the history of humankind. I see, I know, and I hope that we've helped you see and know some of the tools and technologies that are available to you. I hear, I remember. I hope that perhaps you'll be able to remember some of the things that we've discussed today and some of the experience to your advantage, I hope. But perhaps most importantly, I do and I understand. And on that, I can only encourage you and your colleagues 
to make sure your teams get logs in, try out this Oracle Cloud, try it out for yourselves, understand these tools at your disposal, this platform at your disposal, and wish you the greatest of success in building your digital business in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your attention this morning.